My name is Raymond Albright, and I'm going to share my testimony with you today. Now, let me just say right up front that I'm sharing my testimony to show forth the praises of God. And I'm not proud of what I've done in my past, but I am proud of what Jesus Christ did with my life. My testimony is one of love and forgiveness, prayer and patience. I shared my testimony one time at, um, what was the name of that church? High Desert Christian Center. High Desert Christian Center in Barstow, California, and the youth leader came up to me, and the song leader, he came up to me afterwards with a tear in his eye. And he said, I, I don't have a testimony like yours. He said, I've always been in church. I've, in fact, I've never even smoked a cigarette. And then with a tear in my eye, I looked at him and said, I wish I had your testimony. My oldest daughter asked me one time, she said, Dad, if you could change your past, would you? And I said emphatically, yes, I would change my past because I hurt a lot of people in my past and I would love to go back and fix all that I have wronged. Now, I know I cannot change the past, but I know God can change the future. Now, the Lord encouraged me to continue on moving forward in spite of my hurtful past when he simply told me this. He said that he would use my testimony to help more people in the future than I ever hurt in the past. And the Bible says, let him who boasts, boast in the name of the Lord. So with that, I'm going to do some boasting today. Before I do, how about we pray? Lord, I want to do it right today. Lives are at stake. And I ask that you would help me. I ask that you would help me to minister to those of us that are here today. Show us your presence. Let us hear you, see you, smell you, and taste you. Bless us this day, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. My dad, my biological father, has testified that the day of my birth was the best day of his life. The best day of his life was then crushed by the worst day of his life, the day my mother said she wanted a divorce. Now let me tell you that I have no childhood memories prior to the age of 10 years of age. There is one memory that I do have of my dad. It is not, however, one of fun and playing, singing or talking. It's one of fear. Fear because my mom had always told me, son, watch out, because one day there will come a man and take you away from me. And when he does, you need to run. Now, she told me that simply because at the age of four, my mother took me from my dad. Now, she took me from my dad because in her defense, she was simply doing what my dad had already done for her. You see, prior to the divorce being filed, my dad was seeking counsel. And his lawyer told him, have you filed any papers? He said, no. The divorce has not even started? No. He said, then Raymond is your son as much as he is hers. Take her, take him, leave the state of Arizona, and never come back. And that's exactly what he did. My mother was simply repaying that favor. After my mom took me, we moved around the United States so much, actually people thought we were in the military, but we weren't. We were just running. She was always trying to keep me hidden. Anyway, after my mother took me, my dad began a 14-year search and prayer vigil to find his son. He wanted his son back. And he said if he was unable to find me, he at least wanted to know that I would be safe and healthy. So all the while he searched, he prayed. Back to my first childhood memory. Remember now, my mom had told me, son, always look out for somebody. A man is going to take you away from me. And when he does, you need to run. Well, at around the age of 10, someone knocked at our front door. I opened the door, and in the darkened garage, I saw a shadow of a man. When I saw that figure, I ran as fast as I could. I ran to my bedroom, and I crawled up under my bed, and I cried. I cried in fear because I, I just knew that that was the man that was going to take me away from my mother. I felt such fear that day. That fear was unparalleled. In fact, I have not felt fear like I felt that day until the day I joined the military and went to combat. And just like that day at the age of 10, I used that fear to become a stronger, more callous man towards the world and the people in it. As it turned out, the man at the door, he was my neighbor. He simply stopped by to tell us that our dog was running loose. But what I remember most about that day was how babyish I felt. So from that day forward, I wanted to be more like a man, one that would stand and fight, not run, hide, or cry. And that's just what I did. In my eyes, that day, I wanted to be a man, one that would not cry or cower in fear. 
I clearly remember my grandmother spanking me one time with a water hose, and she asked me, Son, why are you not crying? I didn't tell her the answer, even though I knew the answer. I was a man, and men don't cry. The day after I made up my mind to be a man, I saw the big kids in the neighborhood smoking, and in my eyes, they were tough. So I started smoking to be just like them, you know, tough. I wanted to be a man. A short time later, we moved to another neighborhood. And in that neighborhood, the guys, they took it to another level. They not only smoked, but they drank and did drugs. They lived a careless lifestyle. So I wanted to be like them. I've related toughness with their actions and their activities. And that's exactly what I wanted. No fear and toughness. So I did just what they did. And at the age of 12, I was arrested for malicious vandalism and destruction of public property. I was placed in jail. And at the court hearing, I was placed on probation until the age of 18. Now, that didn't stop me from doing all my bad acts. In fact, that encouraged me because I thought I had gotten like a red badge of courage. To me, I thought, probation? What's that? Psst, anybody can do that. I thought I got away with something. I was bigger than any other kids. So I began breaking into homes, and we'd steal items and vandalize their houses. And one day the police took me in for questioning, and I was able to lie my way out of conviction. But I felt the pressure of them closing in on me, so me and one of my friends, we stole a car. We were running away. We made it to the next state before we were caught, but sure enough, we were caught. And they brought us back to our hometown and locked us up in the local jail. On Saturday, the inmates in the cell next to mine told me, they said, you'll know when it's Sunday because you will hear the clickety-clack, clickety-clack of the preacher's shoes coming down the hallway. Well, sure enough, Sunday morning, I heard it, clickety-clack, clickety-clack, clickety-clack. When that man stopped in front of my cell, I was sleeping. I rose up angrily. I screamed at him and I cursed him. I spit on him. I told him I didn't need him and I wanted him to leave. And once I finished, I laid back down. But I heard something after I laid down. I heard that man pray for me. Years later, I heard the story of how my dad had been praying for me. My dad, his wife, their family and relatives. But how little did I know then that their prayers kept me from dying and going to hell. They kept me from committing murder and going to prison. Prayer works, folks. Never give up praying. Well, Monday morning came, and I stood in front of the judge, and he said to me, Son, give me one good reason why I should not sentence you today. And with a tear in my eye, I turned, and I looked behind me, and I saw my mother standing there holding my youngest daughter, I mean my, my youngest sister in her arms. I saw my two brothers standing beside him. And I turned back and I faced that judge. And I don't know how to even explain it today, but I felt it. I just said, because I love my family? You know, he looked at me and he said, that's not good enough. He slammed his gavel down and he said, I sentenced you to two years in Somerville Youth Correctional Facility. Well, I learned something that day. In my eyes, love means nothing. Why don't you just be a tough guy? Don't cry. Be a tough man. Don't love. Be tough. Just be a man. Do what you want, when you want, how you want, and when you want. Take what you want. Hurt anyone in your path because love doesn't help. So why even try? I learned how to survive behind those closed doors. I tried escaping several times. We were always caught and returned. and I finally did all at the time that, that I was sentenced to and the addition for attempting to escape. But when I was released, I was not a rehabilitated youth. In fact, I was a toughened, hardened man in my eyes. I went right back to breaking and entering, drinking and drugs, so much so that every morning I'd drink a quart of Coors and a fifth of JD. My first three period teachers thought I had a kidney problem. And that's because that's what I told them, but the truth was I just had to use the bathroom from all that drinking. By lunchtime, I'd be so high on dope, I wouldn't even know what classroom to go to next. Well, a few weeks after beginning the 10th grade, at the age of 16, we got caught doing drugs and outside of the gym and I got suspended and I just knew that they were going to send me away again so me and my friend we stole my stepdad's motorcycle we were going to run away again this time we we got away with it I stayed gone for two years I never called anyone never made an attempt to contact anybody back home for two years I was a bleak in their eye I was gone now many years later my youngest brother while crying was pounding on my chest. His fists were hitting me as he was screaming, You left us. You just left us in that house with that abuse. You hurt us. And he was saying this because I grew up with five different dads. 
And every one of them were more abusive as they went along. I'm sorry. One day my stepdad, he got, he got so drunk that he hit my mom with a cane. And the fight was on. Me and my oldest brother, we, we jumped on him. We tried to, tried to get him off and hit him. And I was thrown off of him. But when I got up, I ran next door. And I began beating on that neighbor's door. And I was screaming, open up, let me in. And I wasn't doing that so I could get away and hide. I wanted to get to the other side of that door because on the other side of that door was some guns. And I knew that. My plan was to take those guns and go kill that man that day. But I truly believe that because of the prayers of my dad, my murder attempt was thwarted that day. Anyway, back to the 10th grade. As we were running away on that stolen motorcycle, we got pulled over by the highway patrol. As we sat in the back seat of that patrol car, me and my friend, we came up with a plan to lie our way out of it. And we both agreed that if we were unsuccessful in our lying attempts, that we were going to take our helmets and smash his head. We planned on killing that officer that day. I truly believe that God again honored the prayers of my dad because that highway patrolman believed our lies and he let us go. I spent the next two years living a lifestyle that I would wish on no one at any time for any reason. You see, we stopped at a gas station hundreds of miles from home. We had no more money. We had no food. We had no place to stay. But we were approached by a man who offered all of this. All he simply said was we had to do what he told us to do. And so for the next two years, that's exactly what I did. And that's all I'm going to say about that. After two years, I called my mom and asked if I could come home for my 18th birthday. She agreed, so I went home, and after spending about a week with them, I gave her my phone number, and I went back to that terrible lifestyle. But shortly after that visit, my mom had called, and she said, How would you like to meet your real dad? In my drunken stupor, I said, Sure, why not? A few weeks after that, he called. A few weeks after that, we began a phone dialogue back and forth. And a few weeks after that, he said, how would you like to come and live with me in the state of Texas? I don't know why I said it, but to this day I just said, sure, why not? What else could happen? I'm tired of this filthy life. I just want to get away. So I agreed. Three days prior to him arriving to pick me up, I began a drinking binge and a drug binge to say goodbye to all of my friends. So for three days I was in a drunken, dr drugged out stupor. But the day that he arrived, he knocked on the door. I opened the door, and there he was. And to this day, he did something that I'll never forget. You see, I was standing there in the same clothes that I had been wearing for three days. I had vomit. I had vomit on my shirt. That man did not step back. He did not cower his nose. He stepped towards me, and he gave me a hug. And he just hugged me, and he told me that he loved me and how happy he was that he found his long-lost son. And I remember standing there thinking, who is this man? I stink. I'm covered in vomit. He's hugging me and crying and telling me that he loves me. I didn't understand it. But as we drove from the state of Florida to the state of Texas, he witnessed to me. He told me the story of how I was stolen from him and how he had been praying for me for 14 years. I felt the love behind this story, but I was hesitant to make a move. Remember, love doesn't help. It only hurts, at least in my eyes. When we got to Texas, there was a multitude of people waiting. There was a banner they were cheering. It said, Welcome home, Raymond Wayne. I just thought, who are all these people? But after several months of being with my dad, I felt loved. I mean true love. Love like I had not felt since the day I stood in front of that judge and looked back at my mother and the hurt that I had caused them. Well, that love led me to the altar at the church. As I stood in front of that church, I simply looked up and I said, Lord, if you are real, then show me. If you are true, then teach me. But please, just forgive me. He did that. He showed me by His love and through His love and by His grace and through His grace that real men do cry, that real men do love, and that I was forgiven of my past. 
Within the first year of being back with my dad, I joined the National Guard as a combat engineer. My mom actually came to the graduation at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. I told her that day, and I remember it being a very momental day for me. I told her, I said, Mom, I've made it. I've become a real man. I felt that I had made the transition from being a childhood man who was a coward crying and running in fear, that I had become a man, a man's man. I was in the military. After returning from training, I met my future wife. When she was 17 years old, we got married. Shortly after that, we had our first child, Jonathan. I was working as a welder's helper, and one day I got a phone call that said my wife was in the hospital. I told my boss, and he let me leave, and when I got to the hospital, my, my son had already been born, albeit he was stillborn. I remember looking at him, lifeless and pale. He was laying in a box. I didn't want to cry. I didn't know what to do. I turned around and left. I went back to work. I was a man. I'm not supposed to cry. The baby's dead. What else can I do? God, how I hurt her that day by leaving her at that hospital. Two years later, I joined the regular Army as a forward observer for the field artillery. And during my nine years of active military service, we had two more children, Jessica and Rebecca. And then also during my military service, I spent time in Honduras repelling the Contra rebels. I spent time in Panama to oust Antonio Manuel Noriega. And during Desert Storm, I was in Germany training up the reservists that were being activated. I was getting them ready to be shipped into theater. During all these combat assignments, I learned one thing. There is not an atheist in a foxhole. I also learned that I had a hip pocket God. That is, I kept him in my back pocket and only pulled him out when I needed him. And don't you know when the bullets were flying, I needed him. I would cry, God, just get me through this firefight. I just want to get back home to see my family. And when I'd get back home, I'd put him right back in my back pocket and forget about him until I needed him again. But praise the Lord, I met a real practicing, professing Christian. I met a real man of God during my last two years of active service. A man that prayed and cried. A man that loved the Lord and was not afraid to show it. He loved the Lord and his actions proved it. We were stationed together at Fort Irwin, California. We'd ride together back to work and back and forth to work. It was a 47-mile trip one way. When during that trip, Hector Correa would pray and sing worship songs. But little did he know that I would turn my head and inside I prayed and cried and worshipped right along with him. Well, it wasn't long after that that I gave my life to the Lord. I was laying in the middle of the Mojave Desert looking up at the stars when I prayed, Lord, I've done everything in this world a man could ever want to do. What do you want me to do? And from that day forward, God became alive to me. His word became alive. I'd work 22 days on and five days off, and during every waking moment, I'd read the Bible. The words would jump off the page. It was alive. One time I hollered out to Michelle. I said, Michelle, come in here. You have got to read this. And after she read it, she looked at me and she said, Raymond, I've been praying that scripture for you for seven years. That scripture was Ephesians 1, 15 through 19. Look it up and pray it for those that you love. Anyway, my wife was given a prophetic vision. There was a box. And in that box was a lump of dirty, soot-covered black coal. That was me. The lid of that box was closed, and when it was opened, there was a diamond inside. I was that diamond. After seven years of prayer later, I was the diamond in the box. I began to pray and ask God to show me what to do. I wanted to know if I should stay in the military or if I should get out. And as I continued in prayer and reading His Word, I came across John chapter 21. I read how Jesus had asked Peter a question. He simply said, do you love me? He asked him that question three times. Now remember, Peter said he'd be willing to die and to go to prison for him. But when the pressure was on, he denied he even knew him. I felt that that was exactly what I had done. So when I read verse 17, I said to, in my heart, I said, that is the pinnacle of forgiveness. Christ called you to feed his sheep after all you had not done? I cried inside and said, Lord, if 
I'd love to have that kind of forgiveness and